Shipping ARM hardware in the server market today? 
Um, I'm like, the reason I asked is because there was a thing yesterday about Canonical, <coughs> like their build environment. Like you guys built it out of like two dozen panda boards. You know, it seems like if there were no ARM server <laughs> hardware, you know, so, no, if there, anyone would have it, it would be you. There's, there's really not, no. Um, but there's, there's one company yeah, that someone announced something. Today. Yeah, there was yeah. an announcement today, and then there's a company called. It used to be called Smoothstone, and they read their name is different, and they're going to get bought by somebody, but they're really pushing on on server boards. Yeah. So this is really something coming, but and Ubuntu and Canonical are trying to lead the way with it, and just ensure that you know Ubuntu goes well there. Um, it's called Calcita. They build like. 512 cores and 10 new space. I don't know the math on that. It's Cortex A9. Yeah. I'm saying one year was <laughs> there. The initial, the initial reference architecture machine packed 127 nodes, 480 cores, and a two U chassis. Wow. <coughs> um, so uh, look at Lenar.org, and then also uh, there's there's probably some stuff on Ubuntu's blueprints and things on what's going on there. But basically, we're trying to put together a a reasonable image to use as an ARM server. And yeah, and like you said, it's a lot of like people are doing this on Panda boards and basically bringing up a server workload on some uh, sloppy little uh, pizza box solution. But as we get there, it'll it'll go forward. Um, second thing, we're Ubuntu servers working on this cycle is a product is what we're calling the Ubuntu Orchestra. And I don't know, does does anybody in here use Ubuntu in their job, as in install Ubuntu servers or manage? So what what Orchestra is trying to do? I don't know if there's a Orchestra, yeah, a collection of free software services and provisioning, deploying, hosting, and managing. So, basically, the the goal is you 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 walk into a data center, you can install an Ubuntu server that provides an orca the orchestra install the web <coughs> orchestra, and then it can become a provisioning server and a an app to mirror and all the things that you might want to go along with it. And we make um, opinionated decisions on how those best work together, and we make them all work well. So this would be, you know, you can install an Ubuntu that then can allow you to install lots of other Ubuntu's and manage your lab and things like that. <coughs> I was going to try to demo this, but I uh, launched, and you you can use this. Um, there are PPAs for Orchestra if you go to the launchpad.net there. Um, there's some PPAs you can run on top of Natty, I think is as far as they go back. but And then you can, you can also run it in two VMs, like you can launch a VM install orchestra into that and then have the other VM pixie boot and it'll the orchestra server will then install it and hook everything up together. That's how they're doing a lot of the development. So that does work. Um, yeah. What tools do you use for that? Um, what do you bundle in orchestra? The big thing well, so some some of the well, Puppet is one thing. So we're using Puppet to do some big management across them. Um, the second thing is Cobbler. We did a lot of work last session. If you've ever heard of Cobbler, it, um, it's basically a deployment server like this, and it, but it was done by, I think it came out of Red Hat, but definitely Relis who was driving it. And um, and we got the Ubuntu support and the Debian support back into it. It, it had ro bit rotted and was not really functional, but we did a lot of work to get that functional again. And so now we're using that. Um, and then the other portion of Orchestra at some point will be Ensemble, which is kind of, I'm not going to give this a, a good explanation at all. I would suggest heavily that if you're interested, you read the, um, this URL here. Um, I don't, yeah, I, type, I don't know how to tell you to Google for it either, but um, he does a good job there of giving you an example of what it is, but Ensemble basically, <coughs> The idea is it is for services what apt is for software, kind of 
And th I think that's a really good explanation because everybody here probably understands what apt is. You have the idea I want to get um, I want to get this new editor from GVim, and so I type apt get install GVim. And the idea of Ensemble is that you need to deploy a WordPress or you need to deploy a media wiki, and so you say Ensemble deploy media wiki or Ensemble deploy WordPress. And it takes care of provisioning resources that you need to do. It takes care of hooking up a MySQL back end to a, a PHP front end, and they can also layer on top of them, um, you know, like a caching or a round robin to do load balancing. Um, and all the, the smarts for how to hook these things together is done by uh, kind of package experts or <coughs> people who know what they're doing. Um, and so the goal is then, like, with apt, you no longer need to worry about how to install things or build them. With Ensemble, you'll no longer need to worry about the details of how you hook all those things together. And it'll make good decisions and scale. And It's a big, it's a lot of hand waving, and it's, it's not anything that's simple or easy, but you can actually um, go to that, go to the blog entry. Um, there's an, an actual working, like, functional prototype and it, it comes up and you can throw a load at it and then you can say make it bigger and it goes bigger and it handles load better. It's really nice. Is that part of orchestra then? That it, like so manage, the way to I manage all the so nodes? What, what that will do to hook in <coughs> the, like the way that it, the way that it'll hook no. in um, is it will sit on top of orchestra. Right. So where right now the way ensemble works is you say it, it, it's really kind of, well, let's see, it's only provisioning service is EC2, or at least an Amazon uh, compatible interface. So when you say, you know, launch these things, it, it fires up a bunch of instances in Amazon and, and hooks them all together. Um, it will be backed by orchestra, or in the end, you'll be able to do the same thing with bare metal in your lab, where it'll turn on systems, provision them, hook them up together, and scale like that. It's a lot less you know, reasonable, but you don't just have spare hardware usually sitting around in your lap. The idea is it could still function all like that. Um, the, the fourth and fifth point on that list were cloud host and cloud guest. Um, this is, previously we, we had marketed Ubuntu Enterprise Cloud, UEC, and anybody who saw the words UEC assumed it meant Ubuntu Eucalyptus Cloud. <laughs> um, and we are moving away from using Eucalyptus as our primary solution there. And so in doing so, they decided to ditch this, the E, and now it's just Ubuntu Cloud. Um, <coughs> mostly because it was just confusing. But And so what we're doing is moving to OpenStack, and OpenStack's a... Um, a um, a infrastructure as a service solution that provides something similar to what you would get with, it, well, API compatibility with Amazon for S3 and EC2 at least in portions. So the same idea is you can then run a cloud in your data center <coughs> and manage manage your instances the way that um, well, through a through an API, which is what you would get from Amazon. Another any of the other cloud. Um, infrastructure as a service providers. Um, and then, so that that provides our cloud host, and al along with like Orchestra, and Orchestra would go with that, and then our, our, our best as a guest means that we have, we have images available to run on popular cloud providers. That has been a lot of my work, is putting those together. Um, we have, in addition to that, we make sure that we have packages that are necessary um, for people to run the workloads that they expect to be able to run um, in, in the cloud. Yeah. Popular like web, new workloads and popular workloads. Um, that's about it. I wanted to put down that we, Canonical Server, there, there are some openings on the Canonical Server team. I think that there was one for, it's like a bug triager, that's how it was, and I'm probably not giving it justice. If you, if you Google Ubuntu jobs, you'll end up at the top the top URL there. Um, <coughs> hiring, Canonical is a nice place to work. I love it. 
Um, if you're interested in learning more about Ubuntu Server or trying or using um, on Freenode, and there are mailing lists that Google can pretty much find for you. And then the last URL, the, the last URL is this slide deck. Um, you can get that from there. So, and that is an Ubuntu One link. George is going to talk about. So that's it. Personal package archive, and there are some URLs. <coughs> and basically, you have places to get software packages that aren't on your machine out of the box, right? Because everyone needs a little extra something, something when they're setting up their machine besides what's just built into the machine, right? So there's a couple URLs: launchpad.net/slash Ubuntu plus PPAs is a place to go find PPAs, and if you were to look at trying to build things or make put things in PPAs, you go here. So what it is is. Uh, Canonical set up in Launchpad a way for you to build your own packages, .dev files, which is software that installs, and host them. Put them up on a website somewhere that you and other people can get access to on Launchpad. So you have to have an account on Launchpad, and it actually takes your software and builds the .dev packages, and then allows you to go to another machine and say, sudo app get install my super awesome kick ass package, and done. And then boom, the software comes down and you've got it installed. Because we all like packages. Who here likes to compile? Dude, no, I run Arch, I don't like to compile. Are you kidding me? I mean, it's crazy. So what makes a PPA? Packages, software, first and foremost, that's all it is. It's multi-platform. The build servers that uh, the Canonical runs in Launchpad will build both 32-bit and 64-bit versions of your uh, software package. You can uh, it makes it all an app get install away. So what's great about this is it puts it where you expect everything else to be. Because we all use app get install, right? Or are we are we pulling up software center blah blah finding buttons? Really, really. Okay. Um, and then what's awesome is that you can actually build your packages with multiple versions of Ubuntu. So like let's say this was great and all that I can build it for Natty, but you know Craig here is well no he's on Natty, but I'm building my packages for my older you know LTS machine. You can actually build the packages for multiple uh, versions of the distribution and have them all hosted so that multiple people can come and get them. It gets to be a little more complicated and fun than that, but let's just stick with that as a basic, you know, you do that and it, it can work kind of thing. So what I want to kind of go through is, is why do you care about PPAs? So first of all, let's go to talk about the great powerful software developer who here actually has written software. And if you've done like a Perl script, that counts. <laughs> I'll show you, it counts. Yeah. All right, so yeah, so most of us. So the great thing about software is that you can write it, but then the problem is trying to get it out to everybody, right? So I'm going to tell you a story time. We're going to pull up to the carpet. We're going to have a little story time. Back in the day, this is from 2007, George, I, 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 I one time I ran a Mac, and one thing I loved on a Mac was a program called Quicksilver, which was a launcher application. You shortcut it, and then you run all your systems through it, basically, a lot of what Unity is doing these days. Um, 
George hits me up and goes, dude, Rick, you gotta check out this guy. He's got this program he's working on. It's called Known Do, and um, he's just getting started with it. And, but it, it, it kind of does some of what you, what you missed from Quicksilver. You should definitely go hit up this guy and, and check it out. So I went and checked it out. I'm like, oh, this is just like Quicksilver. It's so much like what I wanted. Oh, this is so exciting. Like, awesome, 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 awesome. Except to install it, you had to compile it. And there was like 10 of us that were checking it out and using it. And so I got thinking, you know, hey, I've always wanted to build a package of software. If I were to package this, it would make it very easy for me to install it on my three different systems versus trying to compile it, get the dependencies and everything on every single one. And it would make upgrading it a lot easier. So I like beat through my head just enough packaging to be able to build a version of GNOME Do, and I put it up on my PPA. And here you can see from 2007, here's this uh, clip from the old Ubuntu, from the Ubuntu forums where basically people are like, hey, this GNOME Do is cool, but how do I get it, or how do I get the latest version? And the answer was, go to Ritz PPA, here's a URL, put these in your apps, uh, resource, your sources list, and now you can app kit install GNOME Do. And whatever you do, sudo, you know, app get upgrade, you would get the latest version of known do from then on. So this, at one, when we had the PPA set up, usage of known do just took off. I mean, hockey stick just ran away. It was really, really kick-ass to me. Once you have something as a package, it's amazing how many more people will try it out, will report bugs, will have feature requests. In the case of known do, which was very plug-in orientated, the amount of plugins that came out just skyrocketed. So here, as a software developer, if you want to put your software in the hands of users, PPAs are the way to go, right? Because you can do it just personally. You don't have to have it up. You don't have to put it in Ubuntu itself. You can have them up in your repository. So I'm a user, right? I'm Joe Schmo, who I don't, I don't build software or whatever. Why do I care about PPAs? And it's because everyone wants up-to-date software, right? How many of you guys run uh, Chrome, right? How many of you guys have Chrome 12 right now? I think I do. In the Maddie's <laughs> 12 just came out? Whatever Google puts out. That's Chromium, but I mean, okay. No, it's Chrome. Yeah, well, well Chrome you, you've, got, you've got the Google package from Google. Yeah. yeah okay, yeah. you know, but I mean, like, by default, Maddie will, should not have, I don't, would not expect it to have Chrome right. 12 right now. Because Natty came out and it had a set of packages and those were the versions, right? And then someone comes along and they update the package and you're like, oh crap, I have old software, I suck. <laughs> so you have to go looking for how to get the new stuff. PPAs are a great way to do that. So for instance, if anyone here used Banshee, yeah. Banshee has a couple different PPAs. They've got PPAs for like beta testing, for nightlies for test, you know, for really testing, testing, and stable releases that are updated as it goes. So, hey man, I love Banshee, but I want the latest, greatest stuff, or I'm a Banshee user and I'm so awesome, I help test. Or they fix the bug that some garden man Or, like right, my Banshee's been broke as could be, and they finally fixed the bug, but I don't have it because it's not released yet. You can actually go get the PPA from the Banshee developers and have latest, greatest, non-buggy, crashy Banshee. Right. <laughs> so there was just a blog post on the planet uh, a bunch of today about an in Inkscape is running a PPA, which which is awesome. Here is that these are the package developers running a PPA to help get you the latest greatest software that has the most bug fixes, and you don't have to really think too much because once you set up the PPA and you install the you know, application, it's now up to date from then on. Okay. So uh, the examples: Banshee, Inkscape, Chromium, and Firefox both have PPAs. Actuals. Um, Kernel modules and stuff. There's an Intel uh, bleeding edge like Intel, you know, PPA. So like if you've got Intel bugs with your Wi-Fi or your video, one of the things they may tell you to do is just to go try this PPA and see if the bug's been fixed, but just not released to you yet. So as a user, there's a whole lot of uses for PPAs to help get you uh, bug fixes and things in a hurry. All right, software developer. Oh, okay. So this is different software developer. Um, Anybody here do web development? Anybody ever have to do like minimification of your JavaScript and CSS and whatever, right? So there's lots and lots and lots of ways to do this. I actually was trying to learn Perl, so I um, wrote a Perl script, JSMin that I called it, that did minimification of JavaScript and CSS files. It detected like what extension was, and you could pass it three files, and it could catenate it all together and give you one file out. It was really awesome, right? Except that it had to get these packages from CPAN. Any of you guys ever install anything from CPAN? <laughs> Three hours later and like 150 megs later, I had two like 50 line freaking Perl files. Um, but they're, they're Perl packages and they were, I, were, I was requiring those for my script. I was using them as, as libraries. And I thought, this is great except that now I want to go put on another machine. And I got to reset up CPAN again. 
So rather than set up CPAN again, I actually packaged my Perl script. But in order to package it, I needed to have .dev files of my dependencies. Fortunately, there's this really, really handy dandy tool that says, take this CPAN package and give me a Debian package, and it <laughs> does it. <laughs> it's quite excellent. So what was awesome here is that I took a script that I wrote that I just wanted to be able to install and keep up to date across all my machines personally, and grab the two dependencies that it needed, and I could put them all in my PPA. Now I add my personal PPA from machine to machine to machine, and I've got my handy dandy super awesome script available for me. So I'm not looking to go out and get users, I'm not looking to go out and solve world problems, but you know what, I can make my life easier through using the PPAs. What was awesome was my boss was like, hey, how are you doing that minification stuff? I said, you know what, go grab my PPA, there's a script. Dependencies <laughs> and all, boom. So you're not getting install, install JSMin and the dependencies come down and your script's all off and going and running it. So it's really kind of awesome. Um, which leads us, this also might work for like if you're a um, server admin and you build your own Postgres, but you put it on multiple machines, maybe you should build your own package that you can put yeah. up on a PPA yeah. and then you could just sudo apt get install super awesome Jim Postgres mm -hmm. instead yeah. and get the latest greatest or whatever you custom want for your build. So as a sysadmin, why do I care? All right, again, I do web development stuff, so we use a lot of things like, say, Postgres. For some ungodly, I do not understand freaking reason, the version of Postgres and MySQL in Natty is deliberately behind. So, not to mention the fact that I don't want to run Natty on my servers, so I'm running LTS because of everything else, like, say, kernels that work and crap like that. But I do like to have somewhat reasonable Postgres. Anyone here, you guys know Postgres at all? Um, when they say something stable, I, I tend to believe them. Uh, they tend to put a lot of QA work and stuff into it, and they don't exactly put out a new release every six months kind of thing. So when, when you do get one, you tend to go, all right, it's, that's going to be pretty rock solid. So Postgres, the actual, um, there, there are, there's a PPA available for it that you can use. What's awesome is that they also just released the 9.1 beta is in a PPA as well. So if I wanted to test, hey, does my software work on the latest, greatest upcoming one, I can actually set up like a virtual machine, set up the PPA for the 9.1 beta, install it, install my app, test, and all this kind of stuff. And it allows me to do that without having to actually go through and compile and build Postgres myself. MySQL, same deal. The version is really out of date. It, it drives me bonkers. Well, first using MySQL drives me bonkers. <laughs> More bonkers is after I get past that, I have to install it. But we actually, I've been using, trying to use Nginx for a web server. Who uses Nginx at all? Everyone else is Apache lovers? No? There's some Apache love. Uh, Apache's got good stuff. But um, using uh, Nginx, and then there's also a tool called uWSGI. What's really, really awesome is that oftentimes these PPAs are kind of, I, I call them more official. They're run by the project that does the software. So here is a screenshot from the uWSGI guys' uh, webpage. And when they say to go get your packages for Ubuntu, they say go to, the P go to our website, go to the PPA. That's where they actually put it. So what's awesome is that I trust that, right? Because they wrote the software, they, wrote the, they built the package. If I install it from there, I should actually be supported and able to get all the stuff that I need. So even as a real live, I don't want my crap to break sysadmin, I still want to use PPAs because software uh, packages are actually uh, projects or building official you know, packages for me to use. So that's really kind of <coughs> awesome. And even as a sysadmin, I can get my stable stuff there. All right, so big scary warning time. Your systems will fry. It's no, no, really. Um, the big thing to be aware of is you are installing resources and packages that were not in the version of Ubuntu you installed. And when it comes time to do that mighty upgrade, eh, kind of bets are kind of off. So because of the fact that it may not know how to do an upgrade from something to something else. So really, uh, when you do an upgrade, you want to make sure that either you back off the PPAs, you remove them, you uh, remove the software you had installed via PPA, do your system upgrade, then go back, or frankly, I tend to just do reinstalls, right? And, you know, bring up a second, you know, this, 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 system, this system has to run, bring up system two, get all it set up and going, migrate some data, set up some database replication, you know, and then you kill this one off, right? So uh, it's things that people kind of, you know, you should almost do anyway, but I will say, big disclaimer, that PPAs can cause you problems during upgrades, no if, ands, or buts about it. It's not a completely free run, right? Does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. The other thing is that, You'll find this handy dandy little search box on Launchpad for searching for PPAs, where you can put in any package you want. And you're going to get this. Hmm. 1 through 75 of 404 <laughs> results for MySQL. 
I'm going to guess that not all of these are legit PPAs that I should probably install on my system. Because right? <laughs> no as I said, every Joe Schmo and his brother can go through and, and, and put a PPA, a package up for something. So just because you can go in here and go, oh, in DeFero, he has MySQL packages. I'm going to go get those and hope that my business will run on those. Eh, I wouldn't do it, right? But sometimes there are legit things for it. If you go on the PPA page, it usually says, like if I go on a MySQL one and it says run by the Ubuntu server team. Right? Yeah, right. No, you just look into it. So like the, the Postgres was actually done by a guy, but it's a guy on the Ubuntu server team. So it's his personal PPA, but I know Postgres is used in uh, Inside Canonical. I know this guy is like a head of a server team. I, I'm gonna, I trust his stuff for what I, what I use it for. Um, you know, but it's beware, you know, kind of thing. You have to do your research. What's awesome is if you see things that are run by a team, you'll see a lot of like, you know, the, the, the launch pad pages for a team something or other. That's generally a good sign, right? There's more than just one guy who just went out and put the stuff in. So, but everything from terminals to database servers, it's, it's all kinds of crap in there. Right, so does this make sense? Any questions? I, I'm not going to go into like how to build a package. W packaging is its own thing, and, and you should go do that on you, your own. You should be careful when you install PPAs. I okay. know where it's coming from because anybody, anybody can put the things up there, and the search is terrible. It doesn't pop. It doesn't. Right. It doesn't do it by it's ranking of importance no or way, popularity yeah. or know what you're doing because anybody, yeah. as you would install any package or do anything that's written on your system, you should know what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. This is like the old fashioned Windows, like <laughs> click here to install. Yeah, it'll do it. <laughs> yeah. So is this kind of like a roll your own meta package, like where you want to put a bunch of different... You could. People do use PPAs for a meta package. Uh, some server admins will go through and build their own meta package that says, I want PHP 5.3, MySQL 5.2, um, you know, Apache with this module and this extra Apache module. And then when they get to their system, they add their, their PPA reference into their resource, their source list, and then just app get and install, you know, my awesome company Apache version, and it, we'll go get it all. So anything you can do, you can build a package, you can basically do with this, and you can pull requirements from the base install. So like, you know, on my system, on my little script, I had to package up my dependencies to take with me. If you're you're building a custom SQL, but you're still using some like, that's already good in the system, you can leave that, it'll pull that in, you know. So, but if you if you have a newer version, this is where it gets, if you start building your own PPAs, you have to know what you're doing. Because if you update a version of, let's say, um, I don't know, let's say you update you know, GCC because you need that for your thing, and the rest of the system suddenly has a different GCC. You might have just proved the rest of your system from being able to do anything going for it. You know, I mean, or something like Blender where it, it throws up a, a Python 3.1. Right. Yeah, yeah it, it, it could, you could actually definitely have a lot of fun hosting the system if you wanted to. Um, again, and the thing is, it's just to say that this is great for develop. This is great for a lot of use cases, and it's not always a flat out like, oh, I'm taking you know huge risk. Like I said, like the USB thing. That's the official method of getting the, uh, a supported USB package. Yeah. Okay, so this looks like it's really orientated toward development and programmers, technical stuff. I'm just wondering, if there, you know, since anybody can do this, if there's packages out there for fun things, you know, like. Well, that's like, like what I was saying, like. Um, um, the Inkscape package, the PPA for Inkscape, the PPA for Banshee, music players, they're, you know, from by that team, you know. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there have got to be some game PPAs and stuff. I mean, yeah. there's XBMC. Yeah, XBMC, yeah. if you're doing little media server stuff, you know, that they run a PPA. That, that the big thing is that they can push updates and keep things fresher and, and more frequent than a six month release cycle allows. Right, is that? Yeah. So creating your own PPAs is its own fun and joy because it's Debian packaging and, and everyone should go do that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And while I'm up here, I want to plug. While back, I talked about Bookie. Hey, man, I gotta do it, right? Hey, you I got four it. minutes. You got four minutes. I got four minutes. Sweet. I talked about Bookie. Um, I've got um some multi-user support coming in, and I'm going to be working on a hosted version. What are you working about? Uh, Bookie, my bookmark app. They don't, you don't know if it's from my system. Uh, anyway, so B Bookie's my, my delicious clone that's an open source web app that has a Chrome extension that you can use, and it's super awesome. Um, I, since the last meeting when I talked about it, we have a mobile view now, which allows you to pull up your bookmarks and search and all that kind of stuff yeah, cool. from a mobile interface. So I'm hoping to get a hosted alpha version coming this next month-ish, maybe less. So if you're interested in this, if it's interesting at all, 
Um, I don't have a sign up page um, on the site yet, but feel free to email me at hardtogetmitech.com that, hey, I'd be interested in checking this thing out, and I will put you on a list and let you know when the alpha comes along and uh, if people are interested in checking it out and testing. So just got to plug, 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 right? All right, any qu other questions before I close it in? Awesome. Oh, yeah. So, uh, Bookie, can you put that like in a private place where only you can access? So or is right it now, out uh, on the there, web? There will be a one of the features coming up is a um, concept, now that we have users, is allow private bookmarks, which means you'll have to be logged in in order to see them, and uh, so there'll be an option to say, bookmark this, but make it a private bookmark so it doesn't show up on my user page or anything without me logging in and such first. It's not there yet, but it's the, the hooks are actually be, being put in place right now. You could be starting the same machine in your laptop. Oh, no, no, yeah, Bookie is open source. You can run on your own system anywhere you want. If you want to just run on your laptop, it'll work. It'll do it. Um, if you run on your own private network, you know, that is uh, IP limited or something, you know, whatever you want to do, uh, as far as web app goes, you can, you can do it yourself. I was talking about, I know a lot of people are like, that's great, Rick, but um, I don't want to install it. It sounds like a lot of work. Or I would love to help test that, but um, my server doesn't let me install my own Python stuff. Um, so I'm trying to get a hosted version that I could uh, set up for people. That would be awesome. I would pay for that. You can have a PPA for that. Did I mention that my setting packaging days are I'm not I'm done, but <laughs> only, only what I have to. Uh, you know. Awesome. So your package is essentially going to be his orchestra? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you, uh, you can do an ensemble, ensemble install. Ensemble with with there you go. Awesome. Yeah, so there's yeah, an instance yeah, for yeah. you and everything. That's not a bad idea. That, that sounds like work. Sorry, <laughs> <All right, laughs> sign up for that. So yeah, yeah, so ensemble sits on top. Would sit on top of the package <coughs> primarily. <coughs> on top of the packages and then and then configures them well and yeah. Oh, but so he should do the package first and then the ensemble <laughs> bits. Yeah, the ensemble says, hey, you're asking for a key. You're you're asking for a C compiler that's different from the one I'm seeing. Figure out what to do next. <laughs> Let me know. I don't know what the hell to do now. <laughs> Rather than just blindly installing the third C compiler. It's working on it. Maybe two IROs. We tested it earlier okay. before we started. Oh, 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 that's promising. We're back to. There it is. Yeah. All right. Yay. We just had to think about it for a while. I guess it is. There's another thing that PPAs are good for, by the way, and that is if you're submitting a, 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 a patch for a bug. You can put in a PPA and then submit the patch and mention the, the PPA and how to recreate the problem. It makes it much easier for the, the, to approve the bug. It gives the person who's approving it and uploading it into the main archive a confidence that the patch does what it's supposed to. I saw a hand of Yeah. What resolution are you running? That looks like it's a higher resolution than some of the other screens that we've seen up there. Yeah, that is 1024 by 768? Wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the learning program uh, is, is what I was going to talk about. I, uh, it's part of my sort of life, and I start using it. It didn't work under Natty, so I, I started getting in, uh, involved in patching it just to get the work under Natty. And uh, after I did that, uh, I got a note so one day asking me if I consider helping to maintain it. I said I'd do that for a bit. And uh, so uh, for now, seems like it's a lot of fun. Uh, the uh, program, it, it's simply a way to uh, participate in, in the Ubuntu classroom events. And uh, they use uh, IRC. We've already talked about that. I assume everybody knows what, what that means, what the IRC means. Somebody's asked before, so I gather it's widely known. Uh, there are two classrooms that are managed by the uh, classroom team uh, for public use, and those are the basically. And the reason this is used for education is because it's a lower bandwidth 
than the kind of thing we saw at the, uh, at the, the, the quick, we had the quick talks, I think it was last month, oh, the month exactly. before that, and we saw a very nice web application, which looked like it would be great for uh, doing uh, tutorials of various kinds. But the point is that uh, this is a lower bandwidth approach, and Ubuntu has at its one of its core principles, the idea of accessibility. And not every body in the world uh, has a sort of bandwidth that we enjoy. Some people have old crossbar switches, which make a long bracket, and 33K uh, bits per second might be about as much as they can, they can do. IRC should run with that kind of bandwidth. It's one of the few things that can. So the the, the, the classroom team manages um, learning events using that. Ubuntu uh, educators are also part of the, the learning group. Those are people who teach and want to use Ubuntu uh, in order to teach. And then there are people who write course material for how to use Ubuntu for uh, that sort of thing, tuition for uh, how to make use of Ubuntu. Uh, there are lots of kinds of uh, sessions that are being held in, in the Ubuntu classroom. Uh, there are questions and answers, uh, and there are uh, a couple other things that are coming up. One thing to remember uh, from this talk, if you're not interested in learning, uh, and a lot of people are people, uh, but I do recommend the, the, the uh, classes that are held in the classroom. I don't think it, it operates too slowly. I think it's interesting. It gives them a chance to try some things, get back to the instructor and the instructor <coughs> centers, and get some uh, some help so you really do understand when all is then done what is being taught. Uh, developer week is interesting, I think. Uh, the uh, Ubuntu Loco teams uh, is a new event just happening uh, starting this July. I hope it all comes together. Uh, Cloud Days is coming is coming up. Uh, there's a, a, a global jam. I don't know what that involves in terms of an online event. Uh, but uh, but in any case, the classroom is reserved uh, for those events uh, come September as well as uh, have developer week and open week. I started with open week and then I start in the developer week for sessions. So if you're having some trouble following along, uh, you need to provide some feedback to the instructor. The classroom chat chat room is very good for that. And you can simply do this if you want to by picking up your favorite IRC client. Uh, you can follow along with any web addresses with your own web browser. And if they have slides, you can stop the game and select a PDF viewer and do it all that way. Uh, you can participate fully that way. Some people say, say it's better than using learning. But uh, these are the, the kinds of general sessions that, that are available, questions and answers, lectures, and then the how-tos, which are my favorite. And uh, I think I mentioned these before, but uh, some people do use slides. They're always PDFs. Some people use uh, web uh, references, and some people uh, will have to type some things in your terminal window to install some software. Those are the most technical of the sessions. Most sessions are not that technical. Uh, and as I said, there are lots of ways to do, to do this. Uh, the advantage on, uh, advantages of, of learning, there are a couple, I think. Is I've had some trouble when I first started figuring out how to, how to get a nickname on the It didn't take very long. It, it probably was unnecessary. And Learning doesn't deal with it very much, except to give it a name that the next server doesn't like, get a negotiate something else, and, and do it automatically. I, I gather there are other clients that will do that, too. Uh, you won't have all the stuff where you've got to start this classroom and join that classroom. It joins the two classrooms you need quite as soon as you begin the program. And uh, everything you need is sorted together, generally speaking. 
So it's it's a simple way to, to go about uh, participating in the events, uh, which is one approach. There are no IRC commands, uh, there are no IRC features to it, and the browser and the slides are just very simple stuff. The idea is to keep it simple and hope that, you know, therefore nothing breaks and that will be an easy experience for the person taking the class, particularly <coughs> if they're new user of Ubuntu if it's your grandmother is a mm -hmm. That's a basic thing. Yeah. Could, it's not like it is an IRC client. It's fine zoom for Ubuntu classroom. This is very simple IRC client. Uh, there's a uh, another uh, piece of software that goes along with this. Uh, I don't know if it predates it or it comes late it came later. It's written by uh, Nathan Handler out of the Chicago local and this is affiliated. Chicago logo and uh, it uh, works with any IRC client. Changes topics and uh, makes sure the right people can be talking to the classroom at the right time. So it keeps the schedule moving along, I think. Uh, issues reminders that are classes that classes are coming up, you know, tweet apparently. Uh, and I don't do Twitter, but some people do, and I guess it's a good way to get the word out that there's a class happening. Mm -hmm. and, and and it also helps manage Ubuntu Classroom questions. Now, I, we did some testing about this time last week, and uh, I found out what it was like to try to be helping people in the chat room and trying to say some things once in a while, keep things going along in the classroom. And it was an unnerving to me the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the question management the class bot does, as you can tell, it, it collects all the questions out of the, the chat room, which have to be preceded with the question fold. It saves all those, and then it hands them to the person running the session and asks them if, they, uh, if they're ready for the questions. That it provides them, and they'll even paste them in the uh, classroom for the person who's going to be conducting the session, who's conducting the classroom experience. So I'll start it up now. So just uh, while you're doing that, uh, yeah. is this free? Sure. Oh, okay. Yeah, the, the sessions, it's a good question. But like, it's part of the Ubuntu culture, and it's, uh, the classrooms are, are done by a team within Ubuntu, uh, and uh, the program is, is also created by uh, Joe Bacon. I think that might be the Gorgeous Boss. Yes, yes. And uh, so he wrote the, the learning program that's involved, of course, in all things community with the community. Uh, and uh, volunteers the classes. Learning perfectly for each slide. Any other Yes, the calendar of when the various devices are going to be going out or what class topics are going to be? Uh, yes, yes. That's an important part of the whole mix of and I'll show you that in just a second. I'll pick uh, all of the classroom sessions and I'll just simply go over This does take a couple seconds. I noticed that it does with my regular IRC uh, client as well. I think what's happening now is that we're trying to be identified by the uh, freedom Computer. It sends uh, some messages and some protocols to find out who I really am, and this computer's not going to tell me. And so it takes a little while to kind of have to go on with everything. But it's, it has joined the classroom. You see on the bottom left. And in the chat room right now, I don't know why, but there are 56 people in the chat room. And you see, we have a professor with us right now. And, uh, that's interesting. <laughs> uh, it's an unknown uh, mystery uh, helper here. <laughs> this is, uh, it's George over here, and it should say Jay Casper over here, and it's not, and this is a five or something like I haven't fixed it yet, and uh, now it's come back, and it's embarrassing. So that's, I guess, how it is. But you can see that uh, George, to talk over here, and if we want to, to pose some questions over here, like, uh, 
So are, are these sessions saved off somewhere? Or is it all just live and gone? Everything's lost. Okay, so there's ways of getting to this old stuff. So rather than sitting here and waiting for it to come through, you just... Yeah, well, so if you miss a session, like you're at work or, mm-hmm. or that kind of stuff. Cool. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Greg. Right. It's more than just time-stamped IRC logs. Like all the event channels are logged for IRC, but for the classroom chats, they like they like pull it out and title it by what it was, and you don't just go okay. looking for random timestamps. You, you can see that the schedule is up here. I, I would need to scroll it down to show you. And these are all the events. A lot of times the the schedules will be shorter, and that that's going to take some work too. Have to be refining that, I expect. Mm-hmm. Shortly, but you can see that it highlights our event because you know, mm-hmm. an ultimate line. You know. Did you schedule it at some point, or did that just happen? No, we've scheduled it. Yeah. Uh, set. Otherwise, we couldn't talk in the classroom. Oh. <laughs> so that's sort of handy. There are other tabs. There's a tab for the technical sessions. I was telling you, a terminal tab, mm-hmm. and uh, it's a terminal tab. Mm-hmm. Not here, such a fancy mm-hmm. guy. Mm-hmm. And then there's. Uh, there is a uh, another tab that provides a related uh, web addresses. Maybe George should bring us a different web address. Please. Sure, should you say something? Yeah, <laughs> sure. Okay. Maybe launch tabs. Oh, uh, that's a good one. And you can see that if the session has slides, as is, is ours. Uh, ours do. <laughs> we can bring that over and uh, bring this down. So. And it's another way to look at the sessions. Uh, so that's sort of the nice thing. It's sort of an all-in-one, an all-in-one way to uh, participate. Would you do me a favor? Would you bring up slide 14? Sure, how do I do that? Oh, uh, left bracket, okay. in the classroom, slide, space 14, right bracket. Square right, right? Yes. Okay. Wow. How goes over there? The left side? I, th- I think it needs to be capped. Oh, all caps? Oh, sorry. Side? I think it has to be caps, yeah. yeah there we go. <coughs> So those are some of the people who were involved in the uh, mm-hmm. in the development. Uh, it was unmaintained for a while. It's running again now under Natty. We made sure that that happened before Natty was released. And the very latest release is in it from the PPA. Uh, there are some issues I'd like to address relatively soon. And there are lots and lots. There's like 86 bugs reported against Larry. And more than half of them, probably two thirds, are I like to see this feature, or I like to see that feature, and we'll get to some of those, I'm sure. The thing that sort of <coughs> draws me to the project is the fact that it draws people who are obviously beginners and who will say, "Well, how about how about uh, fixing this little thing here?" And then they 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 will perhaps submit a small patch or make a merge request. <coughs> As of the last six months or so, nothing's happened with those. And I think something should happen to those. If beginners are interested in patching learning, I'd, I'd like to see it. And I'd like to see it be a way for people to be, learn to become uh, developers of open source, uh, open source uh, software. So we'll see if that happens or not. What is it written in? It's written in uh, Python. It's all in Python. Are there plans to make learning the tool that the presenters use to present? I, know that I think that's out of scope. It is. It okay. does not do that, and I, I don't. I think that would probably be another okay. software pack. It might yeah. be able to use some of the same widgets, though. Yeah, probably. And yeah. so perhaps it could be affiliated or part, you know, a different package. It depends on learning. I don't. Right. Yeah. 
But right now, I think what presenters do is they use, they just use the regular, regular IRC tools, and, it, and that is probably just the problem. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the big goal is this one. I mean, the big goal for learning is just to be suitable for use. Uh, so the, the bells and whistles, only if they, only if they really help. Uh, if you care to help on the project, I could sure use it. Uh, here are the, the ways you can help. You can, you can test the course, uh, but you can moreover send us people who'd like to do simple patches, and we can maybe show them a bug. I've identified on the project page some bite-sized uh, fixes mm -hmm. that just about anybody could, could, uh, could work on, and you'll find those there at the web page. Uh, or if, you, if you'd like to help people, if you know Python reasonably well, and you're into code reviews, and that sort of thing, and you'd like to help some, some people get involved, that'd be even better. Uh, and also, of course, there are more substantial bug fixes. You're welcome to try, to try your hand at one and submit a code review for uh, a merge request for one of those. We're using Bizarre. We're just using the standard uh, launchpad tools, which I really like. I'm wondering if I missed it. <coughs> well, I guess I missed it. Uh, so how can you help the, the project as a whole? I know that the, the people who run the classroom could always use someone to teach classes. And so if there's some area of free and open source software that you know about, uh, you, I think you might be a candidate for doing this. You start I'm sure people would, would help you field questions and, and help along. That there are some, if you go to this uh, page on the Wiki Wiki, you'll find the classroom team there, it'll tell you what the guidelines are, and it'll give you a, a place to submit a, a request for a session. So it's it's really pretty easy, and I'm sure uh, uh, I'm sure they'd be happy to get additional ideas. And you might even be introduced by George Castro to the I know George sometimes uh, introduces the speakers on some of the some of the sessions that I attend. We're always looking for people to teach classes. Like if you want to, at any time, even if we're running Ubuntu Open Week, if you're like, you know what, I'm not doing anything this day, I want to run a class on Postgres or PM or something. The whole classroom IRC system, this whole thing is sitting idle most of the time, except for when we do special events. So we've had lo local teams and lugs and stuff say, hey, we're going to do a you know four hour cloud workshop, and then they just go take over the channel. Oh. So if anyone wants to do any of this virtual kind of learning stuff, you can just go to that URL and just sign up, and then someone from the classroom team will get a hold of you and teach you how to use all the tools. Like, given its IRC's ability to like support multiple channels, wouldn't it be trivial to run multiple classes in parallel? Like you do actually, we've done uh, someone running um, a Spanish version <coughs> of the class, like someone was like live translating. Yeah. And stuff. There is, but ge generally speaking, we don't really have enough demand to run concurrent. Classes. Usually, what we like to do is get get people back to back. That <coughs> way, the audience doesn't have to like choose. Um, but yeah, there's no reason you couldn't do multiple. I, I don't think anyone's ever asked for it. There's enough idle time. Yeah. Not. But uh, that's, that's a good the point. There's a the Ubuntu Classroom dash es for Spanish classes. Yeah. They look like they have a huge team. I don't know how how, how often they schedule. Uh, they, they usually their do classroom. theirs with, along with an open week. They'll have a totally separate Spanish schedule for Spanish speakers. They'll try to like mix it up so it roughly has the same topics and stuff. Yeah, that's all run by I think it's the Panamanian team or something, and they just we give them the resources and then they just like run with it. It's like better than the official. Open week. <laughs> the Spanish one is like way better. Oh, is that right? Lots yeah, I mean, yeah, they, they, like, I, I'm really horrible with like the graphics, so I like reuse the same, you know, come to Open Week and they have like artists that do all these like Spanish themed graphics. It's totally like professional, so they do a really good job. So, so what any kind other questions? What kind of topics have, have you seen on there that are maybe of interest to people here? Uh, that's sort of hard to say. The open week will have generally 
in mind to have sessions like what we have. Yeah, no, I have stuff on like packaging, on working with bug triaging in Ubuntu, on things like Python development. There's been just flat out Python uh, talks and things on there. Developer. There's, I mean, basically anything that and is involved in the development of Ubuntu from, there's like how to host local events and things. I mean, they've got really the gamut, whatever someone can come up with to kind of think about and stuff, you know. But ask from, Mark Shuttleworth anything? Yeah, yeah. you know, they'll have that one get marked on there. You can ask questions and stuff. I got the S2 one of things. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, you know, it, it runs the whole gamut. Well, is there something that we should be doing that we're not? I mean, some other topic that, as a group here, we could, you know, provide? Um, I, I think it's all like how the group works, where it's like, this, you know, it, it, can someone, you know, there, does anyone have a topic to talk about it? I don't know that it's like there's what a I checklist that we can go through to kind of yeah. match up against or something. Next time we do a huge event, I'll definitely CC the mailing list and say, yeah, if anyone oh, wants yeah. to. That'd be good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I know. I oftentimes like just kind of sit in it, like during the workday, just kind of have it sit in the IRC client off the side, and just kind of follow it. And you know, some sessions have more interesting than others. Sometimes I catch a good question or two or something. You know, I mean, it's it's interesting to kind of follow along a little bit with. You know, you don't have to give it your full attention and everything. So. Anything else? I guess. Thanks. Thanks. John is a perfect Sorry. example of why you shouldn't submit patches to projects. You might wake up and be <laughs> BBT. BBT yeah. Yeah. Like, Congratulations, here are your credentials. Have a good time. <laughs> and then I think I think the guy who maintained it before like really wasn't he must have been like deleting his emails because we were like, dude, help me out. So I'm kind of in the middle of a laptop transition, so I'm going with an older Older, slower laptop with the world's slowest 4200 RPM hard drive. You must love bringing up LibreOffice in on that. Man, when I saw I saw the splash <laughs> screen, I was like, oh. Um, so while that's loading, horribly slow. Uh, my name is George Castro. Um, I also work at Canonical with Scott. We are 66% of Canonical, Michigan. Um, unfortunately, I'm moving to Florida for a year, so this is probably my second to the last or last mug meeting, but I will be back. Um, so today, so normally I'm on the community team uh, at Canonical, so I work with Jonah Bacon on growing the community and that kind of stuff. Uh, but by the time I realized that we were doing this event, everyone had taken all the good um, cool. topics, so I got stuck with Ubuntu One. <laughs> um, so I'm actually not on the Ubuntu One team, however, um, I do use it, and I am pretty familiar with the product here. And my GNOME system demon crashed for some reason. But whatever. So one of the best things about working on Linux, uh, professionally working on a distribution, is you always have to run whatever bleeding edge crap some guy wrote like the day before. <laughs> so you have presentations, and like the computers never work. So. My normal computer doesn't work, this is my backup, but it also does not work. So um, you should think seriously before you want to do software development as on an operating system as your job, because it's not that fun. Um, just kind of. Um, we got that report, right? Yeah, they do make virtual machines, and. They pay you to say this? No. <laughs> so here's my non working product, you should buy it. Um, all right, we'll give it one more shot. So. Um, well, I'm bumbling around with this. Let me just go ahead and um, get started on what uh, Ubuntu One is. So Ubuntu One is part of our online services that Canonical supports. Um, uh, Canonical is the main sponsor of the Ubuntu project. That is, we're one of the heavier participants in the project. Um, and in order to give away a product for free, Canonical's business model is to basically sell services around it, right? So we give you all that great stuff for your servers at Scott. Um, works on and all that kind of stuff. And if you want to be able to call Scott and strangle him when he breaks something for you, um, <coughs> real companies want to have support, so we sell support packages and all that kind of stuff. So that's more of like the traditional business model for um, for Linux companies, right? Because the software is free, anyone can bundle it and resell it and all that kind of stuff. 
So really the expertise is, um, is around the services, uh, right? That's where companies like Red Hat, Nobel, and Canonical, we kind of do our, uh, that's where a lot of the revenue comes from. Um, Canonical, we're kind of different because we also do uh, desktop stuff. Uh, so we kind of have more consumer-based uh, products. So we call those services Ubuntu One. So Ubuntu One is a paid service that we give some free stuff to. It includes a lot of open source code and it also includes some closed service-based code um, which for reasons which I'll get to in a, in a little bit. So the idea there is we give you the OS for free but there are some services now that operating systems kind of have to com have to bundle um, in order to compete with modern day uh, stuff. Like, um, I don't know how many people, there's my phone, I need my phone, it's my phone, it's my phone. It's, I'm going to do mobile stuff. So I don't know um, how many of you saw um, Steve Jobs' keynote where Apple's like um, kind of rejigging their whole iCloud based thing to basically provide what Ubuntu One's been providing for about a year and a half now. Um, so a lot of, in order to compete in this kind of like market, um, to give features that some users want and are willing to pay for, um, we have what we call Ubuntu One. So Ubuntu One's uh, a bunch of separate things. Uh, the simple one, the one that people generally relate to with Ubuntu One is what we call Ubuntu One File Sync. So this is, uh, this is pretty easy. Now, normally it's not this ugly, but my GNOME system team is crashing. I don't know why. Let me try that. I'm just betting with Rick that someday I'm going to come and not have to open a terminal at a Linux user group. <laughs> He's like, that's like his apocalypse. But it's like my dream come true. All right, there we go. That's what's supposed to happen when software doesn't crash. Whatever. I'm going to open a terminal. Well, wow. you have to take that back. Yeah, keep that running in the background. Terminals are different. So this is the control panel, and this is what the Ubuntu one icon looks like on your launcher. And the most basic thing people use it for is file syncing. How many of you have heard of like Dropbox or iFolder? Right. Okay, so this is a similar type of thing where I have a folder on my desktop that I created. I call it the Let's Test Stuff. And it crashed again, but whatever. Um, and I can create a document and call it uglydesktop.txt. And as soon as I save it, what it does is it takes this folder because I've set it to synchronize and it takes it to this, this place called the cloud, um, which is a kind of overused term there, but basically what this means is the idea is that your computer is kind of uh, more stateless, where you say, I want you to save everything that I care about over here someplace, and I guess I kind of trust you enough to hold my data, and then I connect all my computers to it and all my devices to it, so if I ever need anything, I'm working on a presentation and I forget my laptop or my laptop doesn't work, I can get access to it. So that's basically, when people talk about personal clouds, that's what they mean. Um, it's kind of different from uh, what Scott was talking about, about deploying your own like nodes and, and stuff like that. Uh, even though all that, all this runs on that kind of technology. So, you know, the basic simple use case for the files is um, you just any folder that you have on your computer, you can say synchronize this with Ubuntu One. It'll take, it'll make a copy of all of these and it will send it to a server. Now at home, um, when I get home on my other computer that I also have connected to Ubuntu One, I have a folder on my desktop called Let's Test Stuff and this stuff will be in here. So it's really kind of useful when um, I keep all my work in Ubuntu One folders, and no matter which computer I'm using at that time, or if I'm on my phone and someone's like, hey, do you have that presentation? I have access to it. Um, anyone have any questions about file sync? It's pretty much, yeah. Does it work with I the iPhone, the file sync, or no? Uh, with, like syncing the files on it? Yeah. So um, we're work, what, we're work, what they're working on right now is files application okay. for your phone, um, but that is not out yet. So, so that's the file sync, it's pretty basic. Um, every Ubuntu user, whether you pay for it or not, you get two gigs free, so you might as well use it. Um, I use this in conjunction with Dropbox, I get four gigs of free sync space. <laughs> so, um, but there's a bunch of companies out there doing like this kind of file syncing thing. Um, what we do different is we kind of integrate this with your computer a little bit better. So if I were to create um, let me see what I can do here. I need to create a file big enough to cause. Oh, 
Okay, if I had a big file, this would have like a little transfer bar on it and looks really cool. Dude, dude. Did it, right? George. What? I have a big file. Ooh, all right, sweet. Let's see this crash. <laughs> <laughs> Porn dot. Everyone's like, you're doing a live demo? I'm like, yeah, screw it. <laughs> Despite my better judgment, but whatever. Computer Is this on air? No. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, so you also have this available through the web, uh, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, also, one thing that it does do is you can right-click on files and generate uh, web links and all that stuff. If you set a folder to be public, you can copy web link. And you know how Scott showed you. Here's how you get my presentation, and it was a URL. Um, that's how that works. Um, so it's a really nice way to say, hey, presentation folder, you always dump it in there, you get a URL that doesn't change, and you always know that your, your URL so will be there. email that or, or paste it in the IRC or something. Right, so you're not emailing the, uh, wow. the presentation yeah, to everyone. Awesome. You just say, hey, go to this go to this folder. And I'll show you how that works on the website. Right? That's really neat. So, and then of course, you go to your parents' house, and they have like Internet Explorer 4 and a Windows machine, and you're like, oh no. How do I get access to my files? <laughs> so then you'll sign in. We give you an account, it's a Ubuntu single sign-on account. And then you'll say, hey, I've got 21 gigs of stuff, six, six contacts, and 66 notes. This is the web interface to all this stuff. So if you go to the files, um, and we go to let's test stuff. Oh, yeah. These are the files that I have. So pretty awesome, too, is from here, I can upload a file. So if I was on someone else's computer, and what's really handy here is um, it's syncing to all my computers. So like on the drive home, after he's given me that totally legal MP3 download, um, it'll be there for me. But I, I can create what's folders the, here. What's the cost per gigabyte after two for G? Ooh, um, I'll show you in a second. Cheaper than Dropbox, look for that one. It is? Yeah. So we, we used to... Um, we used to say, oh, I think I need to log out. We used to sell 50 and 100 packs, but they weren't very popular because <laughs> they weren't very granular. Um, so now what we do is we sell them in packs of 20. So you get the two, two gigs for free, and then it's either uh, three bucks a month or 30 bucks a year for every 20 gigs. So, um, and then I'll get to the mobile stuff in a minute because that's, that's my favorite part of the feature. So before I used to have, we had 50 and 100 packs and I had exactly like 56 gigs of data that were important to me and it was always frustrating. So now we got two, so if you buy 20 you end up with 22 gigs and then you just basically buy as much as, much as you want. Um, this is all based on Amazon S3 storage, it just builds on top of that. So you guys are actually hosting it. We do host it but the back end is, is S3. So, um, is there a way of taking these tools and using it on your own servers for no, storage? No, this is, this is all hosted stuff. So, there's actually currently, there's a few um, open source tools that are trying to do this, this kind stuff, of stuff. This stuff's hard. It yeah. takes a lot of work. Yeah, the, yeah, it's definitely, it's not like this is uh, yeah. Yeah. But also this, this, this is, this is more for the person that doesn't, so I don't want to run my own server in this stuff. I want to not care. Mm -hmm. The front end stuff is Or you want off-site backup. I mean, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Unless integration yeah. the automatic Or universal backup. Yeah. Is there, there, um, is there, is there right would you use for backup of your own personal Is there any guarantee it's going to stay there? So, I don't. Yeah, we don't guarantee like backup grade stuff. We say, you know, yeah, we built our business on this. You know, we engineered it not to lose your data, but as with all, all consumer level products. 
I use this as another place to back up to. S so S three got triple. Well, unless you guys go with the cheaper, non super redundant version of S three, but S three has three copies of all your files when it gets there. Um, but like with all personal solutions and all that stuff, I would. So what I do for my personal data is I rsync it to my personal server, and then I, I keep a copy in Dropbox, and I keep a copy in Ubuntu One. So I'm just paranoid like that. Remember too, this isn't, so the file syncing itself isn't really a backup server. So if I delete all these files here, they'll go, they'll be deleted from the cloud, and then the cloud will make sure that they get deleted yeah. on all of my computers. So it's not really a backup thing, it's more of a sync thing. So if you have more folders, <coughs> I strongly recommend whatever archive system you use, you still keep doing that, <coughs> keep a copy somewhere, that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, this is more personal file syncing. So, um, so the false thing is pretty basic, but it's kind of the cornerstone for everything we do. So, well, that's loading. Ooh. Any questions about the false thinking? Yeah, if you yep. delete it on the web interface, then it'll also delete it on yep. all of your CERT machines. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Remember, it's a syncing. Yeah. It's a syncing thing. Got it. Yeah, not a not a backup thing. It'll do exactly what you tell it to do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Does it, like, is the syncing mandatory? For example, you know, let's say I have, you know, three machines and, you know, one of them is connected via a really slow link and as you drop yeah. that two gigabyte file on there from here, so that's is it going to suck up all my bandwidth? Yeah, that, that's, that's a great question, yeah. actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, some of my computers only have certain size uh, disks. So I tell it, you know, don't bother syncing my music, syncing these folders, right? Um, but for the for the limiting, um, you can oh, I forget where that setting is. Craig, you can put a put a equivalent. It's under devices. Devices. Oh, here it is. So here you can tell it um, max upload and download speed. So it hopefully. That feature was like one of the first one requested because I think Craig connected one day and it like saturated his connection. He was like, "Dude, you guys really gotta fix this." Mm. That was a long time ago. <laughs> and uh, so there's that, and, and then the the, <laughs> the, fold, the folder thing is actually useful. Um, not a lot of file syncing services do this. Um, they make you keep stuff in one folder, and then you have to keep subfolders. This actually lets you sync anything you want. As you can see, um, I sync some doc files in here, um, so you can sync your. Uh, you know, bash RC or whatever. What's that? Oh, that's an icon set. I think that's all my icons line up in my launcher. I don't know why I do that. I'm crazy. Um, so the file syncing is pretty basic. Um, one thing I think we did really well. Um, so the music player we offer uh, we offer two music stores. We went to one music store, the Amazon store. And one of the things that we pioneered, which is totally awesome, and everyone's doing it now, um, I'm actually going to spend some of my hard-earned cash on a song. Here. So you can come to Amazon here. Uh, let's say I wanted to buy what was that song I heard today? This one. Bless the tail, right? So here, it automatically downloads my MP3. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things we pioneered is in the past when you bought stuff from the Amazon store or other MP3 stores, um, it would download the song to your computer. And what we do is we download the song automatically to your cloud, and then the cloud automatically downloads it to your computer. So um, computer. while we're getting this song here, we have we have uh, mobile support, um, and this costs four dollars, three bucks a month, something like that. Yeah, four bucks a month. Yeah. Um, so we have an Ubuntu One Music Store song, and what I can do is that it rains on. Right. So this music player, what it does is it connects to my cloud and then serves me up my music. So what's really great about this is I can tell it cache 10 gigs of songs on my phone. So I don't really um, sync my phone or my music player to my computer anymore. It just does it all over the air. And I'm on wireless here, so give me a second. The Ria must love this. What's that? The Ria must love this. Um, actually, it's 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 all legit. Um, 
Yeah, not many people can launch commercial services like this. <coughs> I mean, it hasn't shown up yet. So hopefully this will show up by but the end. Yes, it's legit, but we're yeah. smaller than Amazon. <coughs> being attacked. Okay. Yeah. So, so one of the handy things here is when you buy something from the store, we automatically put it to your cloud. So if you I ever do a new install that? and I set up my, um, my Ubuntu one, the first, I just select my purchase music folder and it just starts syncing to it. One thing that we also do is whether you buy our music or you have your own MP3 collection, as long as if you sync it into Ubuntu One, um, which is this is my other music collection, it's available to all your computers, so we don't limit you artificially in any way. So this is really handy because sometimes this happens. A new album will come out and I'll buy it, and then someone will be like, George, you're late, and I'll get in my car and I'm halfway there and I want to listen to something and it's like, oh, I forgot to sync my phone or burn it to CD or whatever it is. Now I have um, I have a newer car that has Bluetooth and my phone has Bluetooth. So I basically hop in, as soon as the car starts, it pairs. I hit my Ubuntu one and I hit shuffle. And then it just starts to stream. If I've played the song already before, it's cached it on the phone. And then I just, uh, it just keeps playing that. So I, I actually did a road trip to the uh, Indiana local team. And uh, I told my wife, I was like, hey, I have to test this for someone. <laughs> uh, so we have to listen to my music the whole way. And through most of it, um, it was hidden in the cache, most of it. Finally, in the middle of Indiana, um, my phone said G on it, which I found out sometimes for GPRS, which is like way slower than Edge even. Uh, but the cache had been rocking and rolling, and as soon as we hit 3G, it went and downloaded the next five songs. So I always had a cache full um, of the stuff. So th that's pretty handy to me. Uh, I'm so lazy that to me it's worth the, uh, you know, the four bucks a month uh, to not have to sync anything ever again. Um, because things are coming like that lately, right? Um, like my phone always has my Google contacts and my calendar. I have no privacy, but at least, <laughs> at least I'm lazy. So that's that's a handy feature. Me personally, that's um, that's that's my favorite feature, and it's also a good way to, if you've ever thought about how how can I help Ubuntu the project, spend 99 cents on the on a song or something that would really help us out. Don't you go to the Ubuntu One Music Store itself? Yeah, and then we have the Ubuntu One Music Store itself. So this is another partner. So one thing we one thing we're trying to do is diversify the amount of stores that you have here because we um, well Ubuntu makes opinionated decisions about what default browser you're going to get and stuff. When it comes to spending money, consumers always want choice. So we're always trying to figure out ways to add more stores here. So this is a, this is a different partner. This is uh, Seven Digital. They're a UK company, and. Um, And then it basically works the same way. You find your artist and you click. Um, yeah, and then you like either buy the album. They have a nice preview feature where you can hit play and it'll play you part of the song. Um, <coughs> all right, that's enough of that. Yeah. Oh, good song. <laughs> yeah. So this is good. Um, Personally, I'm finding uh, the Amazon MP3 store has really great deals. Like I found 99 tracks of the world's greatest classical music for 99 cents. Yeah. Or Lady Gaga's album when it released was like yeah, 99. Yeah, and that's all that you had. I've got no shame. <laughs> uh, no, but I, I, I found it really handy first. You know, it, it, you know, 99 tracks for like 99 cents. I was like, great deal. And um, so I got that. Now I have all this miscategorized classical music that I have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, um, but yeah, uh, we have that. I, I personally, pr so the store at first, I was like, yeah, okay, that's pretty cool for people who don't know how to steal music, but um, the phone really, the phone really uh, works out for me. Any questions on the music? No, the store's so, awesome. Man. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, not that we're going to steal music, but few free music out there is a way of like taking free music and throwing it into this cloud without Absolutely. actually going to your PC yes. and back up. Any AUG, any MP3, any music file, as long as you put it in a Ubuntu One folder, then yeah, once it gets synced into your cloud, you're good. Yeah. Initially, it might take a while. So I have 3,500 songs. When I first 
set it to sync it took like three days because it has to upload all the songs and stuff. Okay, so the, the user interface that you have somehow out here, like a, a website type thing, allows you to say grab it from this other place, you give it a URL, or how do you actually make that transfer happen? You put it on your system, right? So yeah, you put it in a folder on your system. No, 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 I'm saying how do you get something directly from the no, internet to, okay, so you always have to drop it down to your local right. storage. Yeah, no, you yeah. don't just go yeah. from any web page. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you've given us advantage to purchase software on your, your site to put it into the cloud, but you haven't allowed us to take stuff from other parts of the internet and put it directly in the cloud. Sort of. I think you're getting sort of. Yeah. You put it in your, your folder and it's, it goes up to the cloud yeah. over there. They no, okay, so I'm thinking about if I want to download music, I've got a limited bandwidth, yes. right? right? Right. So now I, I have to bring it down to my PC. Yes. So, but so there is a um, they recently announced the, the Ubuntu one. I'll get that. You can write that to do that. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I'll get I'll get to that in a second. Sorry. How much time do I have? I don't know. Oh, you're running 12 minutes. Yeah. 12 minutes. You said, you said you had a bunch of songs on your computer that you wanted to upload to, to sync to the cloud. Right. These songs are also available on Amazon, right? They might or they might not be. Okay. A lot of these, like, like I ripped like like my There's 300 of them that are. Right. <laughs> yes. Okay. Why doesn't it, is there some way to just get up, get them refreshed cloud to cloud without going through your limited bandwidth? Um. No, that's what the iCloud thing is doing that no one else is allowed to do. What's that? The whole, like, I have this song, just put it on my cloud, fingerprint match business. Oh, oh, and then you can pay them a set fee. Right, so you pay, you pay Apple 25 bucks a year, and it'll look at your, through iTunes, it'll look at the files in your system and go, oh, I see you have Black Label Society on your system. I'm just going to go ahead and put that into your cloud for you. Oh. So that's their big selling no, point they can deal. You don't have to push it. That's the whole point, right? So if you have legit stuff that you you know <laughs> that they can fingerprint and match, right? No, because it's based on fingerprinting off of real files, and so you know that bootleg copy from the concert won't match. Right. But the uh, you know the, the stuff maybe you ripped from a CD or you bought from Amazon should match, and you don't have to upload it. They'll actually just precede your cloud with those files. Right. To reduce your upload size. But no one else is allowed to do it because they had to make a special deal with the record label to get that feature. Um, and Amazon and Google Music have both not done that. And Canonical and their Ubuntu ones uh, does not have that as well. So something else we offer too, uh, I'll just blow through these as fast as I can. Uh, we do note syncing for your Tomboy notes. So these are like a little to-do notes. We sync those and we put those available to you um, on the web interface as well. So let me show you that real quick. <laughs> Where did the time go? So I can check on these notes, and what's cool too is if I'm if I'm on a computer that is not mine, I can read the notes. Let's hope this isn't secret. Edit them right there on the spot. We give you like a little web widget, and then these are all your tomboy notes here, and. And then this thing you can set to just synchronize in the background for you every 10 minutes or whatever rocks your boat. And the last thing is who memorizes these URLs? Just me. Um, we've attached APIs for the entire thing. So if you want to write a plugin or something for a music player that grabs a free MP3 from Miro or something and automatically puts it into your cloud, um, you know, uh, you can do that. So we expose a file API, um, we have music APIs, so you can like uh, write APIs to stream music. So the streaming music stuff, we have, app, we have apps for iPhone and Android, uh, but certain platforms like Blackberry and um, now that WebOS is finally uh, going to be awesome, uh, we need everyone's help if they want to write clients. So the Android app, uh, the app I showed you and stuff, is all right. open source. It's based off the code called Subsonic. And they also have an open source server side that if you want to do your own streaming, if you have your own server, you can do that. Like I said, the value of this is the convenience factor of you not having to set all that up. So um, one thing I, I'm interested in doing, and one thing we are targeting, which we haven't targeted before, um, and I'm kind of helping you lead this, which is scary, is um, it's a cross-platform world. So if we're looking for people who are experienced in writing Windows applications to write um, Windows applications to this. So for example, if I can get my mom on Firefox and putting all her data into the cloud, 
you know, when she's finally ready to move to Ubuntu, blam, it's already there for her. So a lot of people don't like it when we write Windows software, but whatever. Um, I won't be writing it. We actually, we have one guy at, at Canonical who's, uh, who's writing the syncing software uh, for Windows. And like, he's like, man, I can't believe I'm an open source company to write Windows software. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, it's one of those things that it's a long term view, right? I mean, people need, you know, in the past, we've tried to do things where people like, you know, you insert a CD and then we'll automatically copy your data into this partition. And then when you boot into it, you know, we'll have your wallpaper for you and all that kind of stuff. Um, but now we can just shove it all in the cloud and then have it available for them. And then for a lot of people, yeah, it is kind of going to be cheap backup, but like I said, that's why they have people like us to make sure they do their backups properly. So, um, and the API is also available for app developers, so Learned uses, uses desktop account. Account. Yeah, so uh, um, his application, when you set up all your preferences in it, it syncs all those preferences into the cloud. So on your laptop, you have the same preferences. <coughs> so if you're sick of setting up the same like favorites and stuff in your IRC client and all that kind of stuff, um, app developers are working on being able to keep your entire configuration, the parts that you want in the cloud. So for example, I customize my launcher here certain ways. Right? Wouldn't it be cool if I organized the icons this way if my uh, computer at home did the same thing? Uh, you know, sure. your wallpaper, stupid things like that. Yeah. OK, so um, at some point, though, Ubuntu, I would think, and Conical would want to leverage this even for the apps you run on you know locally so you, you don't have to have you know the storage of all your uh, binaries and stuff on your individual local system is that something they're moving toward that or is it just for files this is just this is for your data the stuff okay. you uh, you an individual cares about and we just build that on top of the operating system uh -huh. <laughs> From the perspective of the operating system, I mean, our goal is to make everything in the archive and basically easily reproducible for you, as all you had to have was a list of the stuff that you had, right? Right. Okay, I was just thinking about you know, like a, a real small client type of thing that you could store everything on your cloud, and you you don't even download the application anymore. It just runs on the from the cloud. Yeah. Well, if I was doing that local data business, I'd just run on the USB or something. I'll secure it. Something down from the cloud. So uh, every, everything is HTTP. <coughs> um, so it's secure over the wire, but I mean, what? Over the wire. On, so um, we don't encrypt on the disk, but I don't think we encrypt on disk. Do I'm we? almost certain. That, well, yeah. No, well, okay. We don't. That doesn't mean Amazon doesn't. Right. But. Um, you would have to assume they don't. Right. Yeah, no. So in that case, deal, right? so yeah, in that case, what I would recommend you do is what I do is my my secret stuff. I GPG and then I sync it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So or or you can someone you, you can do disk So it's, it's the same thing with like Dropbox, right? Right. In order for them to provide you a web view of the data, the data has to be unencrypted. Otherwise, it can't give you the data from the web page because it doesn't know what the data <laughs> is. If you don't care about that, you can actually set up an encrypted partition. So that all your files are encrypted on disk, and it will sync the encrypted bits back and forth. Then all you need is some kind of little device to store all your security stuff on. <laughs> then you won't have to worry about that, right? No, but the whole point about this is that even though your stuff's encrypted, it can still be synced as long as you have the other system has an encrypted disk set up with the same right. uh, de encryption uh, decryption key and stuff like that. So you can you yeah. can completely encrypt before it hits the wire across if you're worried about that for really sensitive data. Yeah. You just lose some of the functionality that these things provide you. A lot of this is common sense, right? If you work for the government, you're not using Dropbox. <laughs> <laughs> no, you <I> probably <laughs> are. <laughs> Unless you're working for Sony, you're probably not. Um, so yeah, that's that. Give it a shot. We give you two gigs for free. Um, cool. Let me know if you like it. Or not. Thanks, George. Cool. You like cool. Do the yellow things. If you have any questions, just like post them on the mailing list. I got a question. Or hit up IRC or whatever, the locos. How did this work? I don't know why. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, this is an That's at the file system level. Yeah, a lot of great stuff. So, uh, if I went to a command prompt and said cat that file, it would be encrypted. Or not. It would be encrypted. Right. Well, you do when you access the disk, you, give, you ask for a passphrase to unencrypt it on the fly as you need it. Right? So you end up saying cat this file, and it's like, what's the key to that? Like, you know, oh, it will do that. Nobody would share that. Doing things like unencrypting the amount or what. I'm not trying to do that.
Right. The rest of the year is really like busy. When you installed it, I thought it was a so very busy year for me. Yeah. Well, right. Okay. And, and put it out mounted yeah. around another system, right. I wouldn't be able to read it. Right. Right. What? No panel? Yeah. 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 You'll like, know my opinion. I would think once you're logged in, and you're not getting any information. You can and can. Cards. I don't think we have a giveaway. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. We do. We do. You never use it because yeah. our sync. No. I would think that if you did our sync, you may wind but up. But I know people that are encrypting things like on Dropbox, yeah. and the disk levels, the files go up in sync, but they're encrypted on Dropbox's server and they can't access the files they want. Okay, yeah. so this is the key to pull it down. 